So now we're ready to turn our attention to atomic operations. And you'll see in a second why we're going to talk about those, because that's part of the next assignment. Assignment 1B is the atomic operations used for spin locks. So we'll start by talking about what atomic operations are, and then we'll also talk about some key concepts associated with atomic operations in Java. There's a number of different purposes that atomic operations serve. One of the most important ones is that they ensure that any changes to a field that's shared between multiple threads are always made in a consistent and visible way to other threads that need to use that field. So this really comes back to this whole concept of shared mutable data. So if a field is used in a way that's going to be shared between multiple threads, we want to make sure that changes to that field are propagated to the other threads in a way that's consistent and visible to them at the right point in time. What's an atomic operation? Kind of as the name implies, it's an operation that either occurs all at once or doesn't happen at all. And when I say all at once, I really mean all at once from the point of view of users of the synchronizer. It, there might actually be multiple things happening under the hood, but the net effect is that it looks like it occurred instantaneously from the point of view of, a, of another thread. And I gave some examples before, right? Like, uh, you know, transporter beams and other kinds of stuff. The key point here is you can't stop in the middle and have some other thread detect at this inconsistent, intermediate, non-deterministic state. You don't want things to be left halfway. Any of the side effects that occur as a result of carrying out the atomic operation will not be visible until the whole thing is done. So again, it's sort of this all or nothing thing. There are three key concepts associated with atomic operations in Java. The first is atomicity. And that basically relates to the fact that you want operations to have indivisible effects. So let's take a look at a, a simple example that is not atomic. Here you can see we have uh, a couple of threads that are trying to increment a counter. And as you can see here, one of the threads is going to loop incrementing the counter, the counter being the shared mutable state. And the other thread is going to decrement the counter. And because the same state is being incremented and decremented from different threads, and that state is not protected by any synchronizer or any atomic operation, chaos and insanity will ensue. We have really no idea what the value of counter will be, because it'll be some indeterminate thing. And the reason for that is very simple. Even though it looks like we're just incrementing or decrementing by one, the actual behavior is multiple steps. If you were to look at the assembly code, typically, for incrementing a counter, you're going to take the current value from memory loaded into a register, that's step one, increment the register by one, that's step two, and then write the result back out to memory, that's step three. And so those are three steps. So if two threads are doing those steps, the operations can be interleaved in ways that will lead to inconsistent and surprising results. And second problem, we'll talk about in a second, which is basically um, consistency, or visibility, rather. So atomicity, there, there are actually multiple steps involved in incrementing something. And uh, by default, it's not protected unless you take steps otherwise. The second problem is visibility. And that really deals with when one thread sees the effect or effects of another thread with respect to shared mutable data. So we'll take another example here. This is called loop may never end. And what happens here is you can see we have a, a field that's shared, m, m done, which equals false initially. And thread one is going to um, try to stop work by setting m done equal to true. And thread t2 is going to run in a loop, checking repeatedly that whether m done is set to true or not. Notice it's set to false initially. And because of the way this is set up and because we're not doing anything to the contrary, it could turn out that thread t2 never stops, even though thread 1 has set m done equal to true. How the heck could that even possibly happen? Well, it has to do with the way that caching works in modern multi-core processors. And unless you do steps, unless you do something to the contrary, those values from main memory get stored locally in the processor core caches. And we're just updating the cached values and checking the cached values 
And as you can see here, one thread is setting a cached value to true as an indication to thread T2 that you should stop running, but that never gets propagated out of the cache. So it just sits there and runs. Any, any questions about that? It's kind of like if you, uh, if you had a roommate and the roommate like, took, a, took a call for you and wrote down on the palm of their hand the message that the person delivered to you, and then they like left. You'd have no, no earthly idea that anything happened, right? Because that information was never conveyed to you. So same kind of problem. It's stuck in a cache and is not actually possible to be seen. Um, and now, we're, of course, we're going to talk about ways to fix all these problems, but these are the problems. And then the third problem here, which is even more subtle and pernicious, is ordering. And ordering is what's used to determine when the operations in one thread occur out of order with respect to other threads. So here's a scenario where we have a couple of fields. One of them is called A and one of them is called B. We both, they're both set to false to begin with. And you can see in, in method one, it sets A to true and B to true. That's thread T1 does that. And then the question is when will thread well, when will method two see those changes? Thread method two is being called from thread T2. And we could have all kinds of crazy results. It could very well turn out to be the case that um, B is set equal to true, but A remains false. Even though we clearly set A to true before B in thread T1, the order in which those things get propagated to thread T2 is undefined. The, hardware, the compiler, everything can work in all kinds of clever optimized ways, and you can get very, very weird results. So the point of all this stuff is you, you can't rely on, let's call them naked fields, for lack of a better term, unprotected fields to ensure atomicity, to ensure visibility, or to ensure ordering. All of those things are, in the absence of any kind of synchronizer, um, all bets are off things can, can occur in very you know, sort of interesting ways. And that's by design. That's actually the way the Java memory model is defined. Does anybody know why it's defined that way? Why, why do they make the Java memory model like this? Why do they leave it so sort of non-deterministic? Anybody want to guess? Yes, performance. So hard, modern hardware can do all kinds of clever optimizations that we as mortal programmers, as application programmers, probably don't really want to know about. But they can do all kinds of clever things. They can, it's particularly caching. The way that we get performance these days is by caching. And one of the consequences of Moore's Law, so, so Moore's Law, if you recall Moore's Law, Moore's Law says every 18 to 24 months, the number of transistors on a chip doubles. And that's actually continued more or less you know, unabated for a very long time. But the, the speed of the chips has largely kind of you know, leveled off. So it's four, four gigahertz, I think, is roughly the, the top speed you're going to get out of most chips unless they're cooled with you know, <clears throat> liquid nitrogen or something like that. So, so the speed has gone down. I'm sorry, the speed has not increased the way it used to. It used to be that speed would increase every 18 to 24 months. And now that's kind of petered out, but we still have lots and lots and lots of transistors. So what do we do with those transistors? Well, one thing we do with them is we have more cores, so we got more parallelism. And the second thing we do is we put more cache, so we have things cached. And that's great, in, except when you have shared mutable state, and then you have to find ways to propagate that information around. So that's why systems today are so non-deterministic, it's by design because it makes them run faster when you don't care about ordering and you don't care about caching. But when you do care about ordering and do care about caching, then you have to take matters into your own hands because the compiler and the <coughs> hardware and the virtual machine won't do it for you.